All right, guys. So we are about to start the webinar. Uh, today's topic is Amazon PPC strategies to help grow and improve your business that are relevant to 2024 because some of the stuff that people discuss nowadays is just outdated and doesn't really work as well as it used to, as well as, uh, as, well as it used to. So we're going to be covering some strategies. Uh, we have five speakers, including me, and I'll just cover the topics that we have over here. So for the schedule, um, I'm going to go first and I'll cover Amazon PPC softwares and how they can grow your business. Then we have Rick Wong uh, with the topic of increased sales, profit, and lower tackles mm. in three ways. Then we have uh, Ricky covering maximizing global reach with Amazon PPC uh, and integrating compliance and listing management. And then we have Ruben covering Amazon advertising consoles, new metrics and available pages and how to use them. Then we have Michael covering turn your product catalog into an Amazon ads investment portfolio. Finally, after everyone has spoke, uh, we do have some time for a Q&A session. So if you guys do have any questions, just let us know and we'll get to them at the end of this webinar. Uh, I'm going to start right now. Uh, I'm actually going to take a slightly different approach because I'm not going to go through slides. I've done slides for every other webinar that I've uh, produced so far, uh, but I thought I'd just give you my thoughts on my topic and I could actually show you live uh, what we do on the actual tool rather than just show you guys screenshots of what the tool is. So I'm speaking about Amazon PPC software, as I've already mentioned, and how you can use it to grow your business. Uh, I am the co-founder of AI Hello, uh, which is an Amazon PPC software tool company. And we've worked with thousands of setters. We're an Amazon advanced partner. And we know, you know a thing or two about PPC automation and the way it's able to grow businesses or improve efficiency, both with ad spend and just your own time efficiency because you don't have to do some of the work yourself. So the main ways that people grow their business after using PPC software is number one, they're just bidding better. So usually people that bid manually aren't PPC experts. And even those that are, aren't as consistent and as diligent as they should be with their actual bid changes. So a lot of them aren't checking enough data before making the bid change. A lot of them are doing like what I call double bid changes. Like they make a bid change and they don't wait until you get enough new data before making a new bid, new bid change on all of their keywords just because they have so many keywords. So they do like double increases or double decreases. A lot of them aren't looking at the most significant data. So sometimes they just like download a bulk sheet or just, just go into the targeting page and they do like a bulk edit on a bunch of keywords based on the target ACOS, but they don't really ask if the data that they have on those keywords is statistically like significant or not. Because sometimes you can have a, you know, falsely high or low ACOS and you could end up changing your bids based on that and actually kind of ruining the keyword or the actual ad campaign that you're changing bids on. Uh, and other issues like people killing keywords by decreasing bids too much and not knowing when to revive them because those keywords, you know, when the next bulk file comes, depending on the time period that they're looking at, those keywords might just look like they're not spending or selling. So a lot of issues pop up when people run their bids manually. If you have someone who's like an expert and is doing it 24-7, obviously a lot of these issues might go away, but most people don't have that either because they're just doing it on their own. They're not as diligent with it as they should be, or they're just not Amazon PPC specialists. Frankly, if they're an individual setter, they're probably not PPC experts. That's the first thing I've seen. The second thing is some people do have others managing their bids and their ads, but those people aren't always super competent. And if they are, they're not always on top of things because some agencies have like, you know, 15 accounts per account manager or even 10 accounts per account manager. And that just leads to the account manager not being able to get to the actual work that they're supposed to in time. So that's the first issue. The second issue is people, uh, especially those who don't know how to use bulk, or even those who do, honestly, uh, tend to take shortcuts, right? So when you have to make every campaign yourself and when you have to do keyword research yourself and negation yourself and harvesting yourself, you end up with you know, a lot of uh, friction, right? So there's a lot of like reasons for you to not do these things as often as you should or as early as you should. So a lot of these people will have missing ad types, missing match types, missing targeting types that they're just not covering because they're not going to sit there and create 100 campaigns, even through book. They're just not interested in doing the keyword research and the actual setup for 100 campaigns, right? And that's through bulk. If they're doing this through the actual campaign creator on Amazon, there's just no way they're going to get that done. So out of ad types and match types and targeting types just aren't covered when you're doing things manually. Again, unless you have like an agency where they have multiple people working on the account and they're just uploading everything into bulk. They're actually putting the hours and maybe at that point you have everything covered, but generally people don't. And that's another issue that holds them back. Um, other than that, 
a lot of people aren't tracking things properly, right? So they're not looking at the delta on a keyword level, on a campaign level, on a metric level, on a country level. So they don't know what's improving, what's not improving. Uh, they're not looking at their product level data. It's very common for people to not know how to calculate their tackles, especially beginner setters or setters who are primarily like running their business off Amazon. So people who are Shopify native or retail native bringing their catalog onto Amazon aren't able to like calculate their tackles, don't know where to track their organic sales. So a lot of these metrics aren't available through Sutter Central or through Campaign Manager. And unless you're tracking them yourself using some other analytics tool or you have someone creating reports for you, you're going to miss a lot of this stuff. So it's to summarize all of the bidding stuff that people are either ignoring, postponing, or just don't know how to do properly or do it in a way that's not efficient, which can create like double increases, double decreases, keywords being killed, keywords spending too much, keywords getting bid increases or decreases that aren't based on statistically significant data. So that's the first thing. Second thing is the actual campaign creation. As I've mentioned, there's a lot of friction with that, a lot of reason for people to postpone campaign creation. You'll either miss a bunch of the targeting types and match types that you could use, or you're just going to set up what I call lazy campaigns. And lazy campaigns are like campaigns where you know just create like one auto and you shove every single one of your ASINs into it. And you, you could have that as a strategy and that could be a catch-all campaign, which is different. But a lot of people just have this as like one of their main campaigns for the account and it's not a catch-all strategy. Like based on the bids, you can tell this is just a regular auto campaign that they're running. Uh, so people do that. They create one campaign with multiple ad groups instead of creating you know separate campaigns with separate ad groups. Uh, they shove multiple match types into the same ad group instead of creating multiple ad groups or campaigns to house those new match types. So a lot of people take shortcuts. They either don't set up the campaigns that they should be setting up, or they just set them up incorrectly. And then finally, like uh, what I mentioned out the actual metrics and people not being able to track them. So I'm just going to pop screen share open. If you guys give me a moment. All right, let me just figure out how to do this. I always run into this issue every time. Um, here we go. Share screen. Right, so we have, right, if you guys can see my screen, do let me know. Yes. yes. All right, perfect. So over here, this is the actual tool uh, that we have built. Uh, we have our main page over here where you can see every country and you can actually see the delta for any metric very quickly. So you can see your spend, your sales, your ACOS, and this is business reports plus ads. So you have every possible metric here, including like your refund rate, your buy box percentage, and then you actually have them all on a chart here. So you can just select any two and this makes it very clear if something's like going wrong. So if you have your tackle score coming up, you don't know what it is. Like maybe it's your ads, maybe your organic is down, maybe it's a combination of both. You can just select whatever time period and then you can compare your organic sales across both time periods to see maybe your tackles is up because organic fell Maybe your tackles is up and organics the same. Therefore, it must be the ads. And, you know, there are a couple other explanations for that. So you can check very quickly what's going wrong or right with your account. Then you can actually click into any individual marketplace. This is just a demo account. So this is actually a practice account that we've created on Amazon just to test some campaigns. It's called Natural Things if you guys want to check it out. Uh, but over here, you have a couple things that you can do. So you can create campaigns um, in what's called a campaign format. Let's move you guys down here. So you have different campaign formats and you can actually set up complete strategies automatically. So performance max is universal like format where you can create all targeting types and match types with all of the keywords and ASIN targets ready in place. So you can just drop a product in here, right? And everything is pretty much set up for you. You get the suggested target ACOS and daily budget based on the existing data for the product. And then you can add your own keywords or ASIN targets or leave them empty. And then you can also go into advanced settings, add your own negations, add your own placement boosts, bidding strategies, campaign names, select your own portfolio and actually launch in multiple countries at once. And all of the keywords will actually get translated automatically. And the bid changes uh, would happen automatically because not all of these countries bid the same, especially if there's like a huge currency difference, like an INR or like an Indian rupee versus a US dollar. So the bids would be translated and so would the actual keyword text. So you can set this up pretty quickly. Uh, you can do multiple products at once. The official number is 20,000 ad groups in one go uh, that you can set up with this tool, cross country, cross product, cross everything. So you can get a pretty holistic advertising strategy set up in no time. Uh, and this covers, again, all of the match types and targeting types that I mentioned earlier. We also do SD and SB, but it's under what's called Ad Genius. 
which is a beta feature right now. So I won't be covering that. But once it's up, you can do a bunch of different things. So you can just switch it on, select an ACOS target and hit save. And once you do that, the bids actually get changed every single day to get you closer to your target. So what happens is the software calculates what the ideal bid is for each keyword. And we do that by predicting the revenue per click. So if you have a $4 revenue per click, and we predict that over the next 30 days, um, that you know will be the average revenue per click that you have, and you have a 20% ACOS target, we'd set your ideal cost per click as 20% of that $4. So you can hit your ACOS. So that would be roughly 80 cents, I believe, per click. You guys can correct me if my math is wrong. And uh, you also can basically bid above and below that amount. So you can set your own bidding range. So you could say I'm willing to go up to X percent above my ideal CPC and up to X percent below my ideal CPC. You can set your own minimum spending threshold for each keyword, your own maximum bid, decide how fast or slow the bid changes are made. You can decide how many keywords to jolt. This is what I mentioned earlier to make sure that your keywords continue to spend. You can optimize placement boosts, add new keywords automatically, uh, exclude a campaign from our harvesting because we automatically group campaigns together. Uh, harvest into campaigns, you know, decide what the minimum number of sales on a search firm has to be to be added into this campaign. You can negate search firms automatically and automate day parting. And this happens every single day. And it's able to go back and look at different time periods. So if it, for example, keyword A is a low volume keyword, it can automatically check the last 50 days of data for it to get like a statistically significant number of clicks and sales to actually, you know, decide what the bid changes should be or shouldn't be in that case. And if you have a higher volume keyword, it knows to prioritize the most recent data because that's the most relevant data and you're getting a lot of clicks and sales anyway. So we have to go back that far. So that's another differentiator. So just so this doesn't drag on for too long because we have a bunch of people who need to present as well. Uh, this basically creates campaigns for you and covers any gaps that you have. So if you're missing campaign types, ad types, or anything, this can create them for you. This will add keywords automatically for you, add negations for you, change bids for you. So it does everything on your behalf and you can track the changes through the logs over here and adjust settings based on that, right? So you can customize, you know, when the bids change, when it's not changed, uh, how far it can go in either direction and many other things. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm just going to end share here. That this doesn't drag on for too long. But this is essentially how we've seen PPC software create growth for Amazon sellers. And uh, people usually sign up to our PPC software or other softwares too. There's a bunch of other good options out there. Uh, and they usually see efficiency gains in terms of time, and in terms of ACOS. And if they're like proactive with harvesting and setting up campaigns and everything, sometimes they see pretty significant sales gains as well. So that's it pretty much. Uh, I hope this was useful. And I think the person who's next up is Rick. So Rick, why don't you hey, take Hey, thanks over? for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Seth, I could just share, right? Take over and... Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. All right, everyone, see the slide okay? Okay, thanks, Seth, uh, for hosting. Um, so my name is Rick Wong. I'm the founder of Seller Metrics. We're a full-service Amazon uh, agency. And my topic today is um, increased sales, profit, and lower tacos in three ways. And we know nowadays, you know, uh, profit is pretty tight on Amazon with the fees going up. So the easiest way to improve your PNL your margins is basically uh, making sure your ad spend is as efficient as possible. Before I get into like the nitty gritty details, uh, just additional context uh, before I begin. So not all ad spend are created equal in your Amazon advertising. Indiscriminate cuts to ad spend uh, can cause sales disruption, uh, decline in sales. That is what I uh, deem uh, bad tacos optimization. In the meantime, if you allocate ad spend to ad types that has strong sales uplift, and I will get to that in a minute, and that is what I deem good tacos optimization. All in all, a good uh, tacos, uh, being able to optimize for tacos is really meaning about uh, budget management, being able, being able to allocate uh, your ad spend uh, as efficiently as possible. So the first step in um, in optimizing for tacos is uh, set up a daily account budget. Right? So um, basically how much you're going to spend on a daily basis. 
Uh, this way, you can control the daily fluctuation, right, on a on a day to day basis, and you do this by say setting up a daily budget cap, right? But you want to do a cap on an account level, not on a campaign level only, because if you do that, you'll have like a stronger daily fluctuation. So what is the actual budget uh, that, you know, you want to set, right? So how you actually set up the actual budget is that is what is your current tacos, right? And uh, your total ad spend will be basically 1% less of your current tacos divided by 30 days. So what I mean by that, to give you a very simple example, if your tacos is uh, 10% on uh, sales of $10,000, then your ad spend would be $1,000. And uh, let's just say you aim for like a 9% tacos, right? So from 10 to 9%. So then your 9% uh, your tacos on $10,000 of sales is $900, right? $900 divided by 30. So uh, that would be $30 a day that you should be spending on your Amazon ads if your or target tacos is 9%. And another reason why you want to set a high level account budget cap is that it ensures that it allows Amazon to allocate ad spend a lot more efficiently and filter it down to campaigns that have a better ROI. And I've noticed that Amazon does that if you set like a high level budget cap. And how you do that is that you go to settings and under this uh, sponsored product uh, cap, you are going to set a daily budget cap. Unfortunately, this is only for sponsored products only. And if you're actually spending ads on sponsored brands and sponsored display, there is some finessing to be done to kind of incorporate this uh, whole daily account budget setup. Okay, so now uh, we're going to get to where to cut your ad spend, right? Step number two. So we are going to cut uh, ad spending on ad spend where there is like little to no organic sales uplift. And when I say organic sales uplift, is basically when you increase your ad spend, you could potentially see increase in potential uh, organic sales and also organic visibility, right? So you want to uh, make sure that you're cutting ad spend that does not do that. So specifically what to cut. So I'm gonna prioritize that in this order. So number one, that would be branded uh, keywords. So keywords that are you know on your branded search terms, that does not give you a uh, more uh, organic uplift on like your non-branded keywords. Uh, secondly, your product targeting campaigns. And uh, those could be, you know, your regular product targeting campaigns where you target your competition or, uh, or complement products. Um, and product targeting also could be like the defense campaign, right? So basically that would be targeting your own catalog. Lastly, if you really want to get aggressive with this strategy, you could also look to cut back on your auto campaign uh, as well. That also give you a lower uh, organic uplift relatively to your manual campaigns. And finally, what not to cut, um, and this is to make sure that, you know, you maintain your sales velocity while cutting your ad spend. So you're going to make sure that you are consistently spending your ad spend, your, um, your valuable ad spend to strong uh, uplift campaigns, right? Strong sales uplift campaigns. And the strong sales uplift ad spend is basically your non-branded keyword ads. So these ads could be both your, on your sponsored products and sponsored brands. And basically these uh, are the ads that show up during when the customer searches on Amazon on the search results, right? Those are the ads that you constantly want to be spending your money on. So now we go to, into the how. So we're gonna uh, search for your manual keyword targeting campaign. So these are the non-branded keyword campaigns. You're gonna increase the bids to them. Or another thing that you could do if you're um, trying to increase uh, the bid aggressive on your sponsored product campaign is also change the campaign bidding strategy 
from say down only to fix from fix to um, up and down strategy. And once you do that, you can also scale it up by increasing the budget. And lastly, if you do this very aggressively, you also do this right, A cost, the A cost might be really high for these non-branded keywords because at the end of the day, these are probably the most competitive ad types out there. Basically, the smart money will go up there and bid up these keywords because they know that it gives them additional strong sales uplift. And you could also see a phenomenon where your A cost could potentially increase while your tacos decrease, right? Because you're putting a lot of ad spend into these like more competitive high sales uplift keywords. Okay, it all sounds obvious and easy, but it's not so much, um, it's not, the implementation is not so much Right, because in order to do this, right, you have to be able to segment your campaigns by one, branded versus non-branded campaigns, and two, product targeting and keyword targeting campaigns. So that's why a proper campaign structuring and segmentation is very important in Amazon advertising. Okay, to end it off, uh, who are we? Uh, we are a tech-enabled full-service agency. We create tailored uh, strategies on ads, pricing, catalog management, and conversion rate optimization. And we have a dedicated in-house ad software that implements a lot of these custom strategies. And uh, all of us come from a very strong Amazon selling experience. Me, the founder in particular, I've uh, had a seven-figure exit in 2020. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, here's my email, rick.wong at sellermetrics.app. And uh, if you want to follow additional content where we talk about similar um, uh, topics such as this, you can uh, you know reach us uh, at uh, you at Seller Metrics channel on YouTube. Okay, thank you. All right, perfect. So next up, we have. Let me just check the schedule for us, very quick. We have Ricky. Ricky, why don't you take over? All right, I can see your screen. Okay, well, uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Saf. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And actually, it feels quite nice to be fitting uh, right in the middle on the basis of what we're going to be talking about here in terms of these cool tools that we've got for maximizing PPC. Uh, so my name is Ricky Hooker. I'm the general manager at Expandly. Expandly is uh, an all-in-one SaaS solution for uh, online sellers who are expanding to new countries internationally. Now, what does that have to do with PPC? Well, actually, what Expandly does is helps you through the journey of expanding internationally. And I'll touch a little bit more what that means later. And what we, what we really want to kind of blend in today is what that looks like in terms of how you can maximize uh, some of the strategies of uh, the activities that you might do to expand internationally into your PPC for some really big wins. And certainly and especially using some of the tools um, that you've seen here already today. So I think um, uh, let's talk very briefly about what an international, why you might want to do international expansion and what it might look like. Well, look, if you're, an, if you're, for instance, an Amazon seller and you're in the US, one of the big, best and quickest ways of expanding your international reach outside of your PPC of optimizing your listings is to go to new countries. So adding half a billion European buyers, let's take that for instance, and there's a journey with what that bit looks like to move yourself through the, uh, the, 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 the pathway of becoming ready to sell internationally. Now, I've got this slide up because actually the first thing that you need to do and the second and the third piece that you need to do to be able to become compliant to sell internationally is to make your product listings ready. Now, one of the things that you'll be doing is translating your listings, for instance, translating long, uh, translating your um, uh, your keywords, can translating your content, uh, translating your A+, all of those items in the background. This gives some very unique opportunities when it comes to PPC uh, to, to get into some very uncongested uh, keywords to give you maximum value while really being able to give you a good, uh, good target for your own products themselves. 
let's talk a little bit about about what that might, might look like uh for with with examples well take germans uh, consumers for instance 75 percent of those buyers want to shop in their native language now Amazon will always tell you when it comes to your PP, when it comes to your listings that you need to have your listings translated. And of course, nowadays, even with AI translating like DeepL, you've got some really accurate ways of translating your listings. The hack trick that I want to tell you about here goes a tiny bit beyond that. Because when you go through the journey of making yourself ready to sell in an overseas market, you have to, as I've mentioned, make yourself compliant for the sale in that market. Now, what that means, aside from your taxes and your, you know, your other uh, uh, signing up for different duties and things, what you need to have is a compliant label on your product. Whatever that product is, whatever your ASIN is, whatever you're selling, you need to have a label on that product which is compliant for selling in that country. Now that label will need to be reviewed and will come back will come back with requirements for what's required for that particular country. And what we'll see from the back of that is that the content of those labels gives some really rich pickings when it comes to PPC optimization and uh, choosing keywords and uh, targeting your campaigns in a way which can use this content in a very uncontested way. So whilst particular types of words, um, phrases as part of your PPC and your keywords uh, will be will be ex will be that much more expensive, by being particularly clever with the contents of your label, you may well find that you can get the same effect or optimize or reverse engineer your campaigns in a way which makes uh, your PPC spend dramatically better value. It's a bit more stats there in terms of what's, what looks like uh, in terms of making yourself ready for PPC cans, campaigns in other countries. Um, when it comes to things like Spain, optimizing PPC campaigns, which is not able to be done with, uh, with an AI translation or even a native translation, where you've got local slang and cultural references that you can get a 25% higher conversion rate with your PPC by being particularly clever with some of these local cultural differences. Now, really, for an Amazon seller who's selling abroad, the only way to do that is going to be able to be able to use an expert agency within those within those particular regions. So certainly when uh, the underpinning works being done on the feasibility of the, into those countries and where you might be able to get some ranking in those particular places, that will really give you an indication of whether or not some international PPC uh, activity might be required over and above the activity. And perhaps we'll ask some questions of SAF later of how AI Hello, for instance, uh, automatic translators works through that and how we can kind of blend those two things together. But otherwise, the increases that might come out of giving some PP targeted PPC by, for instance, local fashion trends or uh, different cultural references that might come out in language that wouldn't otherwise be picked up by an automatic translator. But let's put into in, into practice. Let's give give a bit of just give it a few examples here of how we might use a product label. When I'm talking about the product label, I'm not just talking about the the, the GS1 GS2 barcode that might be on it or safety items which might be on that. Let's use this example of an electric device where you've got the option with you have the capacity within the label check to give some explanation of what your of what the product is and that part of the, of the label needs to be translated to make the product the product compliant in the country it's going to be sold so if we take for instance uh, you're going to sell an electronic device and you're going to sell that in Germany as an example you can use the label and keywords that you can extract from the label to uh, be targeting with it on your PPC to give you some wins that you might not all otherwise be able to get from the product translation of the A plus content. So there's some real opportunities to both tailor your labels, but also the label content in terms of adding that into your descriptions to be able to give you some wins with uh, your PPC. Likewise, and this is a kind of reverse engineering, you can use warnings and elements of things that are not allowed to target particular elements of your product 
that are allowed. So for instance, we we'll take this example in the of the wrong way round, but this example of an energy drink, which the label warning requires a specific warning to say that it's not suitable for pregnant women because it's got too much caffeine in it. Hey, where would we be without caffeine? But there's a particular one where you, you're um, uh, something's not allowed from from that perspective. That can be reverse engineered specifically to make your PPC targeting elements where the label can be used in your favor by targeting uh you know low caffeine products or otherwise where you can use maybe competitor product and pro competitor product labels to be able to create your own ppc campaigns so this is something which is quite useful when it comes to translating because you've absolutely got to do those in native tongue uh, in the countries that you're being sold to so some sellers won't translate all of their listings, especially if they're just starting in a country, but their product compl for product compliance, their labels and the associated label activity does need to be translated. And that means that they can run native tongue PPC campaigns in uh, the countries that they want to target. In terms of what that bit looks like, um, I'm using this phrase reverse engineering, but it gives you a bit of an example here of what that looks like when it comes to doing your label check for a country for a particular country and this is this example is for a uh, you know an, an organic device or a cosmetic for instance now in these circumstances there's lots of rules about what you can say and what you can't say well then that comes when that comes through to your ppc campaign if you're selling a product where you're prohibited from saying lots of things uh, within the where you're advertising stuff. That's not the case when it comes to your PPC. So very often when we're talking to clients about launching their products within uh, new markets, and we're asking them what, what they can and they can't say on their products that might turn, for instance, a cosmetic into a medical device, which would be a different product altogether. So Amazon's very, very particular about the types of things that are written on packaging much more so in the European market than it is in the United States, for instance, where you can make claims without any medical background. <laughs> when it comes to selling in Europe, that part is much, much harder. So the difficulty that we get, that we get there is that we're unable to use uh, claims within the product, but that's not the case when it comes to your PPC. So we're often say to our clients to give them the example of using where these claims are that they're asked to remove from their product to add them back in to PPC uh, keywords and campaigns to give them the same effect, even though they've been asked to take those things off of their labels. So this is a bit of a kind of blended hack in terms of how to use compliance activity to give you meat for your PPC campaigns over and above more traditional keyword research. So it's a form of keyword research by using your by using compliance uh, and therefore your listings management to be able to uh, give you significant wins and low contested uh, keywords within or within your PPC campaigns. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, Expandly, Expandly is uh, a listings management tool that handles all of the overseas um, uh, preparation for your expansion. So this is an indication of what the international expansion journey would look like. And what we're talking about here is in and around uh, 0 0.7 and 0 0.8 in terms of the, the, the listings management. But as the part of the journey of what that bit looks like on your journey to PPC in, over, in countries over, over, overseas, you need to get yourself compliant, you need to ship some goods, you need to work out where you're going to put it, it might be into FBA, maybe into a 3PL warehouse. Uh, you then need to be listed, managing your listings and expandly as a tool to be able to do all of those pieces. But on the journey of that, in creating your label compliance, you're giving yourself a real opportunity to give yourself some ammunition for really good value PPC, especially when you blend that alongside tools like AI Hello, for instance, and a good agency, I'm sure we'll hear from, hear from one um, very shortly, uh, a good agency to be able to put those two pieces together for you. 
If you want to hear a bit more about Expandly or how you might go about expanding internationally, uh, my details are there. Uh, you can book a call with one of the team if you'd like to, and you can also Google uh, find us online very easily um, uh, by searching for Expandly. Uh, happy for any questions surrounding that. I know it's a little bit of a kind of reverse hack, uh, but we've had some huge successes with our sellers as they've grown by being particularly clever in overseas markets with the way that they engineer the PPC campaigns and use these new software tools, especially the ones that leave AI as well. Appreciate having me on and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk. Perfect. That was great. Um, Ruben, you're up next. All right, uh, just a mic check to make sure that uh, I, I'm being hearing all right. Yeah, we can hear you right. All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ruben. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, PAS, uh, that's Professional Amazon Services. We are a full service uh, remote e-commerce department for uh, brands and organizations. And uh, we are in Florida here while bracing the potential hurricane impact, but I'm glad to be here and uh, discuss uh, some of these new and very much innovative uh, uh, dashboards and tools that Amazon has been gifting us throughout the uh, 2024. So uh, with that, this topic is related about two of them, which is the brand impression share and then the brand metrics, which are available within the our Amazon advertising console. So I'll share my screen here real quick and get things started off. All right. So Amazon brand metrics and impression share dashboard and how to use them uh, for, uh, you know, for the seller's advantage. So in a nutshell, uh, what is the brand impression share? It's a market visibility increases the indicates how much visibility brands it's having relation to overall market. Uh, second is a competitive analysis. It helps brands to assess their performance against competitors by showing how often their ads shown into compared to others and opportunity identification as it will help us to identify areas where brand may need increase its spend to adjust the uh, strategy. As an overview, uh, what's new and what is different, right, uh, with, with these tools? So with these new tools, you can now see detailed uh, reports on impressions, click conversions, and even your brand visibility relative to your competitors, which is a huge, huge advantage in my opinion. Uh, these insights offer more transparency than ever before, giving us the ability, us as a service provider and the sellers who do it themselves, the ability to refine campaigns in real time based on what's actually driving results. Uh, so let's now take a closer look onto a brand impression share and then game changing metrics to understand what is that and what is the uh, brand visibility. And on LinkedIn, the uh, you know a few weeks back, I have brought one of the uh, more detailed, especially on the brand metrics portion, where we can see where the demand is and how to act better based on that demand, how adjust your bidding strategy. And not only, because in some instances, when it comes to overall demand and category being down, your uh, adjustment not only going to go on a paid ads, but it also will be significantly important uh, to adjust your uh, promotions and deals and discounts uh, where you are uh, going to meet that uh, more bargain hunting uh, customer. So let's start with a brand impression share and how to measure visibility. Uh, this metric tells us how often our ads are being seen compared to our competitors. It answers an important question. How visible is my brand in the search results? Essentially, it's a percentage that shows how much market share of impression we are capturing when potential customer search for our products in the exact category uh, where we are. If our impression share is low, it means that our competitors are getting more visibility. And what we can do with this situation, uh, the two key actions we can take is, for example, increasing bids, and, and to be more competitive with our ad auctions, to be the TOS top of the search, or optimizing our ads to, to our targeting to ensure our ads are showing with the most uh, relevant keywords. And here on the on, on the presentation, you can see how that the keyword, how the dashboard looks like within the all uh, sponsored products and sponsored brands. Uh, for example, we can see we're dominating in a category. This is one example, but it gives you very clear 
idea where the brand is in terms of those uh, results. And also top of the search impression share compared to all products, sponsor products and uh, sponsor risk. So very, very uh, useful tools here and very useful dashboard. So why does brand impression share matter simply uh, matter so much? Uh, simply put, visibility is the key to driving sales. If our ads aren't showing up, our competitors are likely capturing those customers. These metrics allow us to quickly spot where the brand is underperforming in terms of visibility and take actions. Plus, we can compare how well we're doing with the specific keywords or categories, giving us a competitive uh, edge. Uh, next, uh, let's discuss the uh, brand metrics and how to track the uh, customer uh, journey. Uh, the brand metrics, which will help us understand the full customer journey from the first time they see our ad, when they consider our product, and finally, when they make a purchase. So this is a very much a full journey of the product. So with the brand metrics, we can measure key stages of a funnel, including impression, clicks, add to cart rates, and actual purchases. Uh, these metrics allow us to see exactly where the customers may be dropping off, on the buying process and being able to improve our actions exactly at that stage where the impressions or drops actually happen. And how we use these metrics to improve our performance. For example, let's say our impressions are high, but our click-through rate is low. This might indicate that our ads are being seen but not engaging enough to drive clicks. In that case, we act very obvious. We improve our ad creatives or has different keywords. Uh, similarly, if we see a lot of clicks, but not enough conversion, it could be a sign that our product detail page needs an optimization, whether it's images, description, or even price. And overall, in a nutshell, the brand metrics are covering to allow us to analyze the performance, track the brand health, and improve the uh, strategy. So but we talk about these two areas, it is also worth mentioning how to combine these two metrics at the maximum impact. And there is a big reason for that why Amazon put them both on the same, same segment because these two go hand to hand very much. And when we operate, these are in our daily tasks too, but not in a daily, but we measure this at least at the beginning of a month, mid month and an end month, which gives us a very clear projections into how we can act based on an actual customer demand. So in, 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 in two circumstances, to, we kind of can, can see ahead of time what is coming and being able to adjust that. So the real power comes from using both these metrics together. By combining brand impression share and brand metrics, we can, complete, we can see a complete picture of our brand performance. We'll be able to see not, we will be able to see not just how visible we are, but also whether that visibility is leading to customer engagement and sales. Uh, this holistic view allows us to make a data-driven decision that leads to real results. And this kind of a summarizes again to what I just said. This is unique opportunity almost never before to see what is happening trends within our category. Not only general category, which you can measure, for example, with a helium pen, what are the search volumes are giving us on our top keywords, but the entire category and how our competitors are driving and how we are measuring against that. And, you know, this, you know, which will lead us in very much actionable uh, items. So in, in, in summary, uh, these new Amazon metrics provide us with unprecedented insight, as I said, into how our brand is performing and where we can improve by tracking the brand impression share we can ensure our ads are visible and competitive. And with brand metrics, uh, we'll be able to optimize the entire customer journey and drive better results. Uh, and this is kind of the all in a nutshell. Obviously, this is just only one part of it, but I'm very excited about these new launches alongside with so many other new dashboards that came out. For example, the subscriber say, because these allows the sellers and managers divert from the traditional only paid ads customer acquisition and being able to get the insights and have more marketing driven adjustments to how acquire a customer and how maintain them in the future. And uh, again, I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions if there's any.
My name is Ruben. I'm the founder and CEO of PAS. And here you can see the direct email to reach out if you have any further questions or would like to have any discussions on this subject. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me on this webinar. It's been amazing. Great. That was great. Michael, you're next. All right. Let me get my screen share here. Okay. So I am going to share properly, correct myself here. Um, talk about a topic that is actually a step away from PPC, but quite important. So in terms of the tactical nature of the wonderful things that have already been discussed here today, uh, dare I use the word holistic, it's kind of a terrible word to use, but we need to be able to zoom out and understand the, the characteristics of our catalog. And the way that I've been able to do this for a while, uh, I've been at the Amazon game for about 14 years, seller and vendor. And the biggest successes have always come from better understanding the data and being able to segment it with confidence. So typically the problems to solve are a lack of context when you're making ad budget decisions. I don't mean bid optimizations. I mean, actually understanding where to invest in your catalog. And typically that as a result of that, there's a disconnect from the account and individual product performance. So I'm not, you know, bringing any new ideas to the table, talking about measuring ASIN level tacos or ASIN level performance across, you know, say seller or vendor and, and your, your advertising side of things. But there's a disconnect between the two where do I understand what's going to happen overall? The bigger the catalog, the harder it's going to be to understand that. And understanding somewhere in the middle, which I will talk about at the end of this, uh, is actually the biggest problem. It's not really the individual ASIN or the account level. I think most folks understand what's happening there. It's creating those sub-segments and and eventually here, of course, as I, as I put as a note, ad budget decisions, you know, will stifle growth opportunity. There's lots of ways to do that. Um, but at the top level, kind of reactively, especially if you're having a challenging month or your best sellers done, it's easy to just crank everything down. Um, sometimes you don't have a choice and I understand that, but many times there are more choices uh, than brands realize they have. So the mindset and this is kind of tricking our minds to stop doing things the way that we've been doing them is, you know, opportunity focused budgeting on that product group level, whatever that means. And I, I don't necessarily think that just uh, the, the parent ASIN, that kind of group is the, the way to go. It, it needs to make sense for your business. You need to group things however you need to group them according to opportunity, according to your own supply chain launches, whatever that's going to be, you need that flexibility to understand that. So by doing this, of course, you can reduce risk of losing profit and sales trajectory, but being able to confidently make decision and focus on other things rather than being kind of stuck in a loop of analysis paralysis is, is, a, is a big benefit of this. Okay. So I also want to, before I jump into the next couple of steps, really set the tone from my perspective Everyone has lots of different opinions on everything, and I'm open to everyone's ideas. But from my perspective, I like tacos, uh, the metric and the food. But when it comes to leveraging it by itself, I am not a fan of that. If there is not a some kind of profit metric sitting right next to tacos, you're not doing yourself any favors. It is quite possible you are just bleeding in profit, even though you've you're kind of high-fiving, hitting that tacos uh, number. So we have to consider all the unique profiles of all the ASINs involved. Again, I'll keep saying it. The more diverse your catalog is, whether in uh, you know sheer numbers, whether you're jumping categories or there's subtle differences between them, you've got to be able to break them up and understand them. So by doing this on an ASIN level, and having ways to filter and group things together easily, you can really start to tie it up to the higher level and understand what's going on in between. Okay, so first thing, many tools have tags available inside them. Um, some of the best, some of the ones here today, absolutely. 
most of them will not have every single tagging opportunity and identifier that you're going to want. And I'm just listing a few here with a, a silly screen cap of a spreadsheet. There are many more that you're going to want. Um, and that's not a knock on any tool whatsoever. It is not possible, nor is it their responsibility as tool makers to give you every single dimension that you want on a custom level. But it is very important for every brand to take the initiative to segment their catalog, build a referential table in a spreadsheet. This is not something that you have to do every day of the week. This is something that you create every time you add a new product, you have a major change, cost, whatever. So whenever you group this data, whether this is a VLOOKUP or you're using a visualization tool like Power BI, um, you want to be able to group all of your sales performance data, your ad performance data, and filter the hell out of it to understand everything you can do. Okay. So when you're structuring this, in my experience, five core kind of classifiers would be ideal. If you see the little table there, it's you know, subcategory, maybe it's a series or collection. Then you've got, you know, flavor, scent, color, depending all different kinds of things could be used here if you're in a different category that doesn't apply. But so an example was we at Rocket Bike had worked with a brand that was just killing it in the coffee syrup game. And one of the challenges was all the products are so damn similar, but we can't um easily parse out in the data based on flavor profiles, pack sizes, whatever, all the performance and the, and the tools that we were using, we couldn't get to deep enough data to understand, Hey, where, where's some of the profit actually going by the time you throw in, you know, fees from Amazon in here, you have a really great picture of profitability. And so now you add the advertising and you have a very, very, uh, you know, un, it is not forgiving. You're going to, you're going to see things that you like and see things you don't, but we figured out was, Hey, every single two pack, cause they were all the same size. And in this case, um, you know, the same kind of shipping weight, whatever, it didn't matter which one they're just cranking in profit without flipping through these different filters. As simple as all this is that I'm telling you, you will not find those things very easily because there's so, so many other things to focus on. So my, my message through all this, and I'm going to continue to walk through the steps, is simply segment your data deeply so that you can get insights that you never would have had your hands on before. And, and this is not rocket science. I am not bringing something to the table here that is some deep, techie approach, but most brands don't have this or they don't do it quite to the depth that they should. Um, and, and it's just been a major help to me when I was on the brand side in the last five years at rocket bike. Okay. At, once you have that table, of course, benchmark performance, all your ASINs. Now you're probably doing this already, but when you start thinking about how these are going to group and aggregate, when you filter, say, I want to know everything in this series, that's a two pack, et cetera. Think about how this data needs to get aggregated. You might have different thoughts on which metrics you want to go after. There are many aside from these. Uh, inventory levels, all kinds of other things that you could throw in here, but don't hurt yourself. <laughs> um, so one that I, I cannot stress enough uh, from my perspective is cost per order. I don't think that one's leveraged enough measuring performance when you try to compare your actual profit dollars against a cost per order dollar, it is quite helpful. Uh, so just some food for thought there. Also, Anyone who's ever on the vendor side, the ad sales numbers are not true uh, because you're selling at a lower cost than Amazon. The buy box is not your price like a seller is. And you have to manage to different metrics, your product cost that you're selling to Amazon. So this referential table becomes essential because most tools are not telling you, you know, you have ship cogs and other numbers there, but I'll stay seller focused here. But considering everything here that you possibly could to understand when I look at this on a monthly level, at the very least, I understand what's going on. And I've always got to have year-to-date if I'm going historical. Okay. From there, you've got to create ASIN and group level targets. Um, you've set those benchmarks. Start filtering and playing with that data to find new ways to look at it. And then start deciding on going forward, how do I want to group these things? 
you know, I've kind of always grouped them just by series, but now that I filtered them, I'm seeing, you know, really this series is, I, I, I haven't thought of it. You know, we have our own biases. And again, sometimes this is really silly, simple stuff. I've been looking at it by series, but there's actually three different subcategories in here. I should not be looking at it this way anymore. Um, so sometimes you end up flipping. Sometimes you end up not prioritizing that series anymore. And you focus on those product characteristics or their uh, profit profiles, et cetera. So create the groups. These groups in the middle are what will make your lives easier. It's it's not going to help make the top number, you know, in measuring that, that's going to be the same. The ASIN level will be the same. It's the stuff in the middle. Okay. So keeping this in mind as you go forward, be curious about your own catalog and its performance on different dimensions. You'll be, again, surprised, the good or bad, but try to use this as a way to lose bias about your catalog. You will uncover so many different things about, especially the medium level and lower level movers that don't get a lot of attention. You might know all this stuff inside and out from your top 80% revenue drivers. But when you start to aggregate these things, it's a cue. And so what I will also say here as I'm rounding this out at the end, this is not just to you know, look at these group level metrics and performance and trends every month um, and just go make ad decisions. Yeah, sometimes it is. But more than anything, just like any good dashboard, it's going to cue you to say, why is that? And why is it good or bad? Not just why is it bad? Because we do that a lot too. We get caught up in just trying to put out fires, but get curious about why medium and low level stuff that you've looked at in a different set with a different set of lenses is doing well. Why is that? So as I said a couple of times through this, the magic is usually found somewhere in the middle. Keep messing with those groupings. Keep just ideating on ways that you can look at this data and it is not difficult there. Like I said, there are many ways to do this, especially with, uh, we've got LLMs, chat GPT, any of these can help you. If you're not a Excel wizard, it's very easy to get answers to put these kind of things together. I, again, don't, I'm not recommending trying to make an insane amount of homework for yourself, but there's some things that you need to know from uh, a brand perspective that even the best tools won't be able to give you. And that's okay. Be willing to do a little bit of this extra work and uh, it can really make a difference in, in your uh, ongoing success. Okay. So in closing, uh, my name's Michael. I am from Rocket Bike. I am one of the co-owners. I've been in, on the Amazon side for over 14 years um, of things, but uh, I was a startup owner. I was on the brand side. Um, so I understand what it's like to answer to a PL at the end of the month. And um, and what we do is we focus on helping brands grow on seller and vendor central. We do a lot of work on standalone projects, strategic support projects, as well as ongoing management and conversion optimization with data-driven creative. It's uh, been a pleasure sharing some thoughts with everybody and also to listen to the other great speakers here today. So thank you very much. Great. This was awesome. Uh, so we do have some questions from the audience that I'm going to go through. And I apologize for looking down. I'm actually working with two screens here and an external camera. It's my first time using the setup, so it's just working out a bit weird. But we have some questions for each of the speakers uh, that I'm going to go through right now. And I think we have about 15 minutes for this Q&A section. So if you just give me a moment, let me pull these up. So for Expandy, we have... The first question is, how can integrating compliance measures like GPSR, responsible person, and EPR improve the effectiveness of Amazon PPC campaigns for global expansion? Hey, we, I don't think we can hear you. I'm not sure if it's just me. Hmm. Right, we might have to come back to you then until you figure this out. Um, so for the question after that, we have one for Ruben. 
Uh, and it says, how can brands effectively use brand metrics within the Amazon Ads Console to enhance their advertising strategy and improve campaign performance? Uh, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, so they were asking how brands could use brand metrics basically to improve their performance. So the brand metrics, uh, to you, it is very much tied to each other. The way you can use it, because the brand metrics shows the multiple, the, the funnel uh, sections from the awareness consideration to purchase. That is the areas that each a separate has a separate segment. You can see where to invest more to capture that. So let's say you are up on awareness, but you're low on a consideration. That is the area of focus. But in generally, the easier way and most simpler way to look at it is when you have your shoppers change percentage, category median, and then category top percentage, it just basically tells you where are the general category and where are your shoppers. For example, if the trends are up, it's a really good indication that you can amp all your budgets and be more aggressive when it comes to your advertising because you know there is a demand and you can capture as much as possible of that increase in demand within the certain categories. And when it comes to when you're seeing this, the demand is down and it's also very important to measure where are gen generally your competitors are and where you are because in some cases, you may actually capturing much more with your competitors where you can readjust it. But let's say when the trends are coming down and your overall sales are coming down and market share coming down as well. In that case, what you would want to do within the paid ads, you would want to reduce some of the ad spend, push it back, and instead being offered and start offering areas of, for example, promotions and deals, which means the demand is going to be lower, competition is going to be high. So just try to attack with an ads May, may actually decrease your conversion and impact your ROAS. So promotions and deals will be much more insightful and useful in that case. So that's how you can adjust. But again, this is a very much multifaceted approach to this when you look into these uh, both metrics. Uh, so you need to understand what is your strategy goal with that more specifically, but direct results, that's how you can find it useful. Just follow where the trend is going and adjust your beats and ad strategies based on that. Perfect. Ricky, is your microphone working now? All right. Yeah, still no luck. Can't hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, let me cycle through some other questions and get back. Unless maybe it, you try say, saying something now? Yeah, it doesn't look like it's working. I'll get back to you again. Uh, Michael, we had a question come in for you and they're asking how you can set unique PPC performance targets for each product. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so unique PPC performance targets. Now think of it from the perspective that we were just discussing, right? When you understand it in context with the rest of the catalog, you should consider the, let's say if you set a group, this is where you start to have a lot more confidence. You can look and see, just like in the way we approach advertising. We know if you've grouped things in a portfolio for a certain product type, that certain campaigns are just going to be more costly than others, right? You're going after an aggressive exact match, uh, high volume keyword versus something else. We should look at our product targets the same way. Not every single product is going to contribute to the same sales and profit numbers. But the second part of this, I would say is don't fall into the trap of idealism, right? Because a lot of times I've seen brands go through kind of the exercise that I mentioned, you lay all your costs out, you get everything. And then you say, well, this is where my taco should be for this based on my profit and whatever. Um, that's fine. You should do that. But you should also set it from where you are right now and maybe make some step goals to get where you want to go. So if, if it is a product that you're spending significantly on and it's a good amount of your ad investment, meaning it's probably driving a good number of sales, think about setting intermediary targets, you know, whether that's ROAS, ACOS, you know, tacos, whatever. I always say put tacos on a timeline. If we talk to a new client and they say, this is where we want to be, I say, when? <laughs> That's an important question. Is it, you know, next week? Because you're going to force a lot of things and, and probably tank some things. Or can we 
step to it. So when you set that goal, consider the, its contribution. If you've grouped it for performance, consider the surrounding group and its, you know, its contribution amongst that. And then consider making some reasonable intermediary goals to get to that ultimate goal you're looking to set, you know, where you want to reach. Yeah, no, I was smiling the entire time because we actually deal with a very similar problem where someone comes in and they're like, you know, I showed you guys the tool a couple uh, minutes ago and it's like set your ACOS target and someone will come in for the product that's at a 400% ACOS. Like it's a new supplement, for example, that they've just launched. Their cost per click is $5 and they're selling the product for 20 and they want to go all the way down to a 20% ACOS, which would require <laughs> almost 100%. They're probably like 120% conversion rate. If I'm being honest, and you have to explain to these people, it doesn't work that way. Number one, like some products just aren't going to hurt, uh, sorry, hit certain targets. Like not every product's going to perform like your best performing product. And then number two, like you have to be realistic. Like certain categories have certain average ACOS and TACOS levels. And if you're at those levels, there's probably not that much of a decrease that you can do from where you're at. Like if your TACOS is 15%, you're probably not going to get down to 5% without like severely hurting sales. So uh, yeah, no, we're dealing with the same thing, especially since it's so like numbers focused and people are literally putting the ACOS target in for every campaign. And this applies on the campaign level too, actually, I should mention, because you could just have a campaign with very bad keywords, right? And you're not right. going to get that to perform the same way as your best campaigns. And people often onboard onto the tool and they're like, I'm going to test this out with my five worst campaigns. And we'll see what you guys can do with my five worst campaigns. And the truth is like, they're the five worst campaigns because you have a bad product in there or because you have bad keywords in there or because of a you know multitude of other reasons, not because the campaign isn't optimized correctly. Right. Yeah. So you should tell people put your best or at least your average performing campaigns on this and see how it does. Because if something's doing severely bad, like it's doing bad for more than one reason, it's probably just not the PPC at that point. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. There's, it's also, you know, whenever it's a new product, like you mentioned, that's, that's always a challenge. Um, and I, what I usually say in that situation is, you know, we're, we're investing in advertising, but advertising should be looked at as we're, we're buying data. We're buying yeah. information too. We're buying what doesn't work. Are we learning from that data or not is a, is an important question. Um, but it's part of, yeah. I, always going to say, I have no crystal ball. You will start upside down. If you're okay with that, that's the way reality is going to play out, especially supplements, right? Yeah. You have these high CPCs, but ex coming back to what we're talking about, when will we reach that? It, well, it also has, how much are you spending? If it's on a trickle, it's going to take a long time to learn. So yeah, good point. Yeah, there. exactly. A uh, new seller, a new product is usually the most difficult combination because a lot of these people have like I guess some idea about how Amazon's supposed to work and what type of ROI they're supposed to get on day one. And a lot of them aren't realistic about why or why not someone would buy their product. Like they come in, they have sometimes, and this is actually pretty uh, common, uh, an above average market, sorry, above uh, market average price. Like, hey, I'm selling something premium and they're like 30% above market average and their product generally isn't actually premium. Uh, they have you know, between zero to five reviews. And then they come to me and they're like, hey, why is my ACOS not at 20%? I have a 30% margin. I need my ACOS to be at 20%. So I can make 10% on every head sale, which number one, isn't realistic in general. Most people aren't at 20% ACOS. And number two, you have to be realistic at what your product is and why someone would or would not buy it. So yeah, the, right. these have been like my learnings and probably you've come into, uh, run into the same thing over the last few years because it's pretty much the same pattern with every seller. Yeah, but sure. uh yeah ricky any luck now hopefully i'm back in line yeah. online can you hear me now perfect yeah, you can hear you. Perfect. okay you did it <laughs> sorry uh fast change of hardware there my apologies uh so uh yeah the question was, was surround it was a great question surrounding some of the fundamental pieces that underpin compliance for your products when you sell into a new into a new region and was specifically the, 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 the question that was asked there was from a seller that's obviously selling in Europe. And it's really topical because something like GPSR, it's a new regulation. There's, there's a bunch of messages coming through from Amazon uh, on a daily basis, depending on your product category, uh, asking sellers, even existing sellers, to apply to, GP, to GPRS. The, the, what that means is um, 
getting de data which gives traceability of your products and come back to what the, the, the question was asked from the uh, from the attendant as well about EPR this is a tax that's paid on um, on, on, on product packaging and extended producer regulations not much you can do with PP, with PPC there as it happens this is a you know a, a compliance piece of a tax on the inbound so in answer to that question not much you can do with EPR responsible person is an address in a region that you might put on again not much you can do with with the uh, ppc there but when it comes to gpsr that's a different match altogether because when it comes to gpsr the you need to keep brand registries updated if you're a manufacturer uh, if you're a reseller you need to capture some of this data and you need to put that into the right pack category but it means that that data within the, the register within the uh, within those categories is shown within the listings and that listings might be things like manufacturer information, safety information, all the kind of things that, that will be wrapped up within this legislation. Generally, it's about traceability, uh, ethical uh, practices and things like that. But here, there's a whole load of text and keywords, or keyword opportunities, should I say. There's a whole load of text, there's a whole load of, uh, of additional uh, activity that's sitting inside the listing, which is all searchable from on the data table, and you can then be using for PPC. So if you're circling back to uh, existing ASINs overseas to make them comply for cheap to GPSR, there is some new opportunities to then circle back and say, can we use these techniques to be able to optimize our listings uh, or optimize our, 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 our PPC? Now, in comparison, it's interesting touching on some of the things that Michael was saying in terms of the crystal wall and and, and arriving upside down. You know, you, you, you're getting quite deep here into uh, into the opportunity. But for some of our sellers that have made this work, huge, huge wins, mainly because there's some much, much cheaper, a better value from their ad spend, and therefore your ad your budget goes further, and uh, and you're simply getting more people to your page. So none of this is about. Tacos, uh, fajitas, or any other acronyms that come with this. This is just about uh, using the word, the data sets that you've already got sitting in your your listings. And yeah, as that question, that is a great question because the reality of the situation is anywhere where you're adding content uh, into the back end into Seller Central to make yourself compliant. You're adding words, which could be opportunities. You're adding new opportunities. And if you go full circle with that, you could even be clever with the app, with what you're writing into these boxes, uh, into these into these boxes within Center Central for your compliance to make some wins further down the road from PPC. So um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Very perfect. The final question is for me actually, and it's how do I choose which PPC software to go with? I generally say that there are plenty of good options and it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, usually PPC softwares are going to fit into one of two boxes, either AI softwares where it's kind of black box, like a Perpetua, for example, where you just have to create the campaigns through the tool. You have to use their own campaign structures. You have to automate bids and everything in the specific way that they have it set up from their own backend. Then you have other tools like Scale Insights, for example, where you can create custom like workflows, like if this happens, do that. If one happens, do two. And these are usually the two categories. Uh, generally, the black box approach works for some, uh, but with certain tools, like again, Perpetual or M19, you can't even set up your, or keep your own campaigns from Amazon or set up, and set up other campaigns uh, on Amazon or through box sheets or anything, which can be annoying. So a lot of people haven't been using these tools lately. Uh, and a lot of people have actually been going toward more rule-based tools, and some of them do implement algorithms or AI, uh, like Scale Insights does right now. So I think there is a happy medium, uh, which what which is what we're personally going after with the AI Hello. So with us, we do have like the AI aspect where you can also set up your own like bidding ranges. Like you can go from this minimum bid to this maximum bid. You can set up your own rules for harvesting, for negation, uh, for day parting. So you can probably just go to a middle ground software is what I call it. And you can get the best of bid automation. You don't necessarily have to do like an if X happens, do Y rule set because those sometimes do work, but can be problematic because you're going to sometimes, um, I don't know, you can call it underthink like some of the actual logic that goes behind this. Like in theory, these rules look super easy. Like if I'm above target, just drop a cost. If I'm below, just increase it. But setting up certain rules like this can end up being problematic. Uh, when you don't consider all of the factors 
um, within the account. And you also have to customize these for each account. So I'd say probably use AI, but don't go to uh, for uh, for like a black box tool where you have like zero control over what's happening. You have zero control over the actual like changes, like a change log or something and the reasoning behind them, zero control over your own campaign structures or anything else. So probably the middle option would be the best option. And middle options would include AI, hello, scale insights, and a couple other tools. That's pretty much it for the webinar and for the questions that we had. Uh, thank you so much for joining and for listening to us um, like present our different topics. And for the other speakers, thank you guys for joining and presenting the information that you had. I think it was all very useful. And this will be on YouTube, so you guys can just check this out at um, AI Hello's channel. And uh, yeah, thank you. And we will hopefully meet again soon. See you guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Bye.